Good morning. Just cranking things up here. Just getting awake. Um, it's the 11th of August. It's a big day for me. I already know that. I've got a few deadlines. Self-imposed, I suppose, but very symbolic. And I have to execute those today. Um, got to go to court and do some testifying. And that's all arranged and set up for a proper outcome. It's moot at this point. It's just a matter of if the other party shows up or not. And I kind of hope he shows up because it'll be a growth opportunity for me. I'll get to do a little bit on my feet. I don't like these courts very much. They aren't our courts, but they're corporations. They're actually banks in disguise. And they, they deal in money. Whatever gets the court the most money, that's justice. Especially in family court. Did you know that they, in family court you can lie? Get away with it. You can commit crimes in family court, right in open family court. Especially if you're a woman. And get away with it. It's no kind of a court at all. And they set it up. So the court gets the most money. So if she's got the least resources, they're going to award the children to her so they can tap resources from the man. Yes, they do. They make money off those child support payments. Everybody's got to grease their hands with a little bit, a little piece of it. And of course, should she get herself in a better position, the court reverses this decision and decides that they're going to make the money go the other way because she's got the bigger wallet. That's what's happening today. And you ladies think that you're getting justice. <laughs> you know, you're getting your comeuppance is what it is. You're just taking the role of a man and being sapped and robbed of your resources. Like a man is robbed of his resources. It was okay when you were on the receiving end and the courts were getting a cut of it. And yeah, they get a cut of it. But when you're on the giving end, or receiving the shaft, should we say, you're not too happy. That's what you get with what you've created, with, with the statism you've, you've created. I look in the mirror and I like myself better. I listen to each of these videos and I actually like the guy. It's not too bad. I had a rough time liking myself for the first oh, half of my life easily. Because I always heard such negative talk from my parents. All those little things of, you'll never amount to anything. <clears throat> if you don't do what I say, if you don't do that, well, you're worthless. <clears throat> all that stuff adds up on all of us. It's a universal thing. It's not just me. It's you, too. It's all of us. So we take that loose and wild and very unfounded speech and we internalize it so every one of those utterances that comes out is like a spell being cast upon us it's horrible how vulnerable we are to these things but there's moments when I look in that mirror and I am reminded of what Paul said he had to do and I'm reminded of the mental gymnastics, it appears, they were mental gymnastics, that he went through. And what he was modeling for us. And what Yahshua was modeling for us when he was trying to tell us, hey, the kingdom of heaven is within, it is here. Yeah, it is here. Unfortunately, it's really tricky. Sadly, it's not very straight ahead at all. But maybe I'm trying to make too much of it. Maybe I have too much of an ego. Maybe I have too much of a... My personality is too strong, so I can't just cave to it. But part of it is the problem that I'm not strong enough. I don't have good boundaries, proper boundaries. That's why I became such a, a good, amazing empath is, and understand people so well, because I can get in there and merge with the other son of a bitch, and I can look at that mess and become it, and then I have trouble getting myself separated out of it. I don't like that feeling. You know, a lot of you say, oh, yeah, I want to be an empath. No, you don't. 
Being an empath just means you got lousy boundaries. It means you can't defend yourself very well. It means you better be careful because you'll lose yourself in the other person and their mess. And you don't want that. But in order to help people, I had to go there. I had to go to those dark recesses in the mind, figure out what the heck was going on. And I have sat with some amazing men. When I say amazing men, the things that these men have done for the nation, what they have pulled off and accomplished in their lives, is just outrageous. I mean, really amazing. And they've been sent off to do battle for us without our knowing about it or knowing about them for the most part. It's pretty sad in that sense. But the other thing that might be sadder is these men are willing to do it in a compartmentalized way. In other words, they're just following orders. They don't know if what they're doing is really for the greater good and what the impacts of it are going to be. They just don't know. So what do I want you to do? I want you to get out your Bibles. I want you to read Paul. I know it's difficult. I know they messed with the sections of Paul more than any other because they didn't want us to have access to that wonderful freedom and the kingdom that it delivers to us. The Bible can be very tricky. It's kind of a tricky book in some ways. I'm sorry, but it is. It's a little bit on the mystical side, too. Yes, dark mystery. So I got a little darkness around me. I got one little tiny bulb on me with just a few watts here. The sun is coming up off to my right. This is the time of day I love. Actually, I like it just a little bit before this. But I'm trying to relax. I've been on the road for three days solid, and I and I really wanted to make, make my goal in three more days on Sunday, but it's impossible. I'm only one-third of the way through my trip. Man, I had a good ride yesterday. I was on the back roads of Missouri. I'll tell you, the interstate of Missouri just plain sucks. It is ugly. And all of those places where you can pull off, ain't nothing level. It's all crooked, physically unlevel. And I had a rough time because of the fog I had to deal with, too. And here I am going slow to save fuel. And the problem is with these hills, you're going to burn the fuel no matter what. So when it comes to the secondary highways, the two-lane roads, oh, the twisties and the turns and all that, it was Porsche country, man. I mean, this was the place to have a Porsche car. Now, I'm driving the sports car motorhomes. This is the shortest Class A. It was the shortest Class A for years with a nice, strong frame. doesn't have any slides in it. It's really got a good frame to it. Oh, and I got a steel roof. I know because when the guy did the work on the roof, he complained and cussed that roof because it was so hard to get, to get the screws and the bolts into it because it wasn't aluminum like most of the roofs. This thing's got steel in its roof. It's made better. And I got a little bit more power than the average because I've got the Banks Power Pack, which makes a world of difference in torque, which is what you need to move one of these big pigs down the road. And I hit those cur turns, those curves, those twisties, those wild undulations in the road. It was, a, it was a good time. Been a lot more fun in a little P car, a little Porsche. It would have been a lot more fun. But I don't like the little cars much anymore. I don't like getting out of them in particular. Getting into them is no joy either, but getting out of them is really a nightmare. Ah. So I took this little punk on the road, back roads there, and I was driving pretty much the speed limit and the suggested speeds for the corners. I've been on this road a couple of times before, and I'm just starting to learn it, actually. So I'm remembering a little bit. I don't get this way that often. I haven't been on this road that much. Um... But I'll tell you, some of the cars couldn't keep up with me. And here I am with a car in tow behind me, which changed the dynamics of the rig completely. And I was probably driving at 70 to 80 percent of capacity. And I know I hit 90 a couple of times. And I almost lost it a couple of times. But I was doing my best to have a good time. We don't get many good times. So I enjoyed that. It wasn't speeding. It was dynamic. It was all I could do. Here I am going down the road with 10 tons, I guess. A little more than 10 tons. Full water tank. 
full fuel tank, car in tow. So what, I've got 3,000 pounds behind me and I guess I've got 21,050 pounds total. I should have stopped and waited. I was right there at the weigh station. They changed these weigh stations up so that they're remote and they're electronic and automated. And I missed the days when you had a guy in there because I could pull up. And he would check my weights for me because I wanted to make sure that I had things loaded right. What I have learned is it's best to stay within the boundaries. It's best to stay within the limits the engineers gave you that they put on rigs. They give you those for a reason. <clears throat> your your motorhome lasts longer. Your axles last longer if you don't overload them. My last rig was not engineered well. Most of these travel trailers are not engineered well. They've got mismatched components. And the worst thing today is that all those nuts and bolts holding them together are not American made. They're Chinese made and they're not made to the same specifications we once had. I mean, those bolts, those nuts and all that used to be tested and they used to be very uniform. They had to meet certain specifications. But once that stuff got shipped to China, all those specifications went out the door. So that last travel trailer of mine, it had axles on it rated at 3,500 pounds. Now, mind you, the trailer was rated for 8,000 pounds. That's what the tag said on the outside of it. Total capacity, 8,000 pounds. But your axles are only... 3,500 pounds times two, 7,000 pounds. Okay. All right. Okay. We're, we're cutting it a little close on that. And then I found out about my springs. The springs underneath her were inadequate. As a matter of fact, it was maybe 6,000 pounds of springs. I don't remember exactly, but it was less than the axles. And I went through... I tore up both springs twice. I went through two sets of axles. And then at the very end, just before she got totaled, this young man who does off-road work, you know, those off-road guys really got to know their stuff and they've got to make sure their equipment's up to gear. They will bust it up because they're... They're taking it to the limits all the time, banging it up and down on those rocks. This young kid, I, he had done some um, <clears throat> done some some molding for me and some repairs I needed done, and he was pretty helpful. And I was you know, telling him about the problems with the axles, and uh, and then the problems with the springs. <laughs> this young man, maybe 25, looks at me and says, "Yeah, <clears throat> well, they didn't put the proper uh, the proper lugs on it either." What do you mean? He says, well, each lug's able to can handle so much weight. And they only put 5,000 pounds worth of lug nuts underneath that whole thing. So it got worse as you went along. And this is one of the major manufacturers there out in Oregon. They got very upset when I discovered this stuff about their build. And that year they were throwing them together and just throwing them out because the demand was so high. Man, the last few years demand was high. I wouldn't touch a coach from that period. I wouldn't touch a travel trailer at all from that period. It ain't worth it. Anyway, I'm on a pilgrimage. I'm headed over to see my new rig. If this one's not my new rig, then I'm on to go get my new rig. One of the others going to be mine. I'm hoping the first one works out. Um, she is the queen of the road. They don't make coaches like that. If they made a coach like that today, it would be over a million dollars. So I'm going to have to put tens of thousands into her to fix her up and keep her on the road. But it's worth it because it's going to be a much better coach than you can get built today. You can't buy anything like this today. And you got to put up with the fact it's old and it's going to break. Nobody wants to do that. These things are nightmares when they break to get them serviced well. I'm under a lot of stress, and I like my presentation right now with you because it's pretty cogent, it's pretty coherent. I'm doing well. Don't have any word salad going on. 
not, not creating words, not juxtapositioning words, except right there, there, okay, fine. Um, I'm trying to de-stress. I've got too much stress going on. I'm fighting on too many fronts. I really didn't want to go get this coach right now. I got to go into the heat to do it. It's a real juggling act. But I'm going to do it because it's a major lifestyle change for me, a major investment. And I actually can afford to do it. That's what gets me is I did okay with my investments over the last couple of years. Um... Unfortunately, everything's a racket. It's all controlled. So depending upon how I handle this, I can maximize my my gains that I've had uh, in the last two years. But I'm probably just going to be cashing in. I might be cashing in everything for all I know. The second coach, the guy wants more than more than market value for it. And it's such good shape, it's so desirable that I'd like to have it. But it takes almost everything I have getting cashed in. It just takes too much. And the other one, and I'm hoping to get, and hoping it works out, I, I'm hoping to get by by just putting 15 grand more into it. But unfortunately, that'll probably go to 30 and 40. I mean, this coach that I have, I put 40 into. It ain't worth it. And some of these people say they got to get their money back out of it. It's like a damn car. You have to pay to maintain it and keep it on the road. You don't get all that maintenance money out unless it's an old vintage Porsche and you happen to get the right year and the right make. Some of those go up in value tremendously. But you may think, wow, that's really made some value. Well, I want you to know something. Usually the value that it accrues, unless it's nuts and people go berserk, which they do, Usually the value that accrues is equivalent to what it takes to maintain that thing and run it for the whole time. So, if you're lucky and you hit it right, you break even on it. You don't make any money. You have a good time with the car. That's the problem with owning a Porsche. I don't want something that controls me like that. The motorhomes tend to do that too. I don't want something that controls me like that. So I'm trying to stay balanced and in focus, but I do have some deficits in my life and I have some dire needs, survival needs. And unfortunately, I am forced to do battle with a woman again. Women aren't fair. You all aren't fair. Nothing fair about you. You don't play fair. You don't fight fair. I mean, there's no, there's, there's no equity at all. I mean, you want equality once in your direction and you're gaining and you're benefiting, but you don't want any responsibility that seems to be the universal condition is you all want to stay children and the courts let you do that and it tears up men in particular because we're the ones that get held for everything my god there was a case in family court this guy was dressed up in a suit he'd been in prison for five years for failure to pay child support female judge in this court she was good well, she was decent in that appearance of that brief setting. I don't know what the outcome was. But the woman who was declaring, and the child was there, and he was damn near, well, he might have been 18, but he certainly looked to be about 16, at least 15. He was a big boy. He was not small. I mean, this one was tall, and he looked pretty buff. He was a handsome-looking kid, and you could tell that he was on edge. Accompanying his mother into the courtroom against his father, who failed to support him and pay child support on him so badly that they put him in prison for five frickin' years. Paternity test results were in. Proved what the woman knew the whole time that the man that she had put in prison for five years was not the father. Five years for nothing. And she admitted it. She knew it the whole time. She knew he wasn't the father. But it was like an, oh, well, oh, well, what's five years of his life? I was getting my child support payments. I had to have this done for me. I had needs, you know. I have feelings, you know. They have to be catered to, you know. I'm a princess, you know. I'm the queen, you know. I'm the boss lady, you know. You know, what a judge should have done at that point would have been to take her into custody, 
charged her with the fraud that she's pulled, with the lies that she's pulled. And she should have been made to go and do five years in the penitentiary like that poor man had to do and have, his, have her life ruined like his, she ruined his life. Well, five years might be a bit much, but I would say a mandatory one year in prison in the penitentiary with no parole, no, no time for good behavior served. You're doing a year hard time period. And imagine how much money that guy spent because he spent five years in the penitentiary. So he paid child support for what, a dozen years? He paid child support for a dozen years before he stopped paying child support or, or couldn't, wasn't able to pay child support. We don't know that part of the story. One third of the, of the, of the babies born in these marriages or in these relationships are not fathered by the man the woman puts it on. She falsely accuses the man one out of three times. And we think that's fair and she should be able to get away with it because she's just a girl. She can't hurt a fly. No, I refuse to fight with the women. I will run. I will walk away. I won't have a damn thing to do with you. Or I will do it. But believe me, after all I've seen and all I've been through in my life and as much abuse as the women in my family put me through, I'm not playing games. I'm not taking chances. Y'all are dangerous. You are the predators, not the men. You are the evil ones, not the men. Remember the first woman, Eve. Was that short for evil? Got to think about these things, folks. Why was she called Eve? And in the Bible, she says she was mother of all the living. Hmm. What living do they mean? Let's see, Cain and his line. And who was the father? <laughs> no, who was the father? It wasn't Adam. That's why Cain murdered his half-brother Abel. They had the same mother. So the story continues on. And I remember when feminism started. And I embraced it because as a little boy, I could see the imbalance. My mom had it made. She was at home all day with us kids. She didn't like that very much. She wasn't a good mother at all. Everybody else thought she was a good mother, but she was negligent as hell. And she beat on me pretty badly, and she hurt my back so badly that I, sh I should have had medical attention, but I had to suffer through my entire life because of that. Yeah, it's true. Eight seven, she yanked on me so hard that about, it, it rotated the vertebra deep inside me, right behind my heart. It twisted my, it, it cocked my shoulder out. It turned me into a hunchback. My sister wailed on me with her elbow, jumping up and down, hitting that elevated, that protruding shoulder. Hunchback, hunchback, hunchback. Oh, it hurt. With her elbow, it hurt. And that probably was the beginning of my sister being beating on me and being allowed to beat on me, given permission by my mother and my father. That lasted for almost a decade. Yeah, my life was bad enough that when I saw those movies about those killers and stuff, the weird stuff, or like the Boston Strangler, I understood that those guys had been through hell. And that's the way they chose to go. I didn't choose that route. I chose a route so I was actually turned out okay. But by God, it was close. It was rough. Because they weren't very nice to me. I understand my family's dynamics. I understand the family heritage and how that was passed on from generation to generation. It stops with me. I'm aware. 
It took me many decades to become aware. I'm still learning and growing. I'm still a growing boy. I really like that. I wonder what I'll be tomorrow. Well, I do know this. I look in the mirror and I like what I see. I talk to myself and I justify myself and I don't like that. You see, what I've learned is we can't justify ourselves. All we can do is condemn ourselves. That's what that line of thinking does to all of us. That's the human condition. You got that internal tape going on. You're no good. You're never amount to anything. If you don't do this, then you're worthless. You have all that shit going on in your head. It's not true. It's not your fault. You're not to blame. However, you are responsible. It's your job to take care of your problem. You see, that's the message my uncle gave me when I was a young man. I was a woe is me fellow. I was a victim. A very good victim, as a matter of fact. My uncle was a straight shooter. And he told me something I took to heart. He told me, you better take care of your problem. And at that point, I didn't know what he said and what it meant. All I knew was that it was my responsibility. But the other thing that I didn't know either is the way he delivered the message. I could take care of my problem. It was a far more affirming and uplifting message than I received from my parents. He told me straight up, I'm responsible. Hey, you're responsible. Take care of it. You can take care of it. He didn't say that, but it was implied in the delivery method. Heck, back then I wouldn't have even believed him if he told me I was able to take care of it. It would have been a justification and we would have been wondering, is it really possible or not? You know, that's how these things work, folks. I'm trying to demonstrate it to you. I'm trying to give it to you. We undermine ourselves with our self-speech. We try to justify ourselves. And in that course of rationale, we become defensive. You don't want to be defensive. You don't want to have anything to defend. Inherent in your defense is your condemnation. So that's why they said justified in Christ. I don't like that term very much. I don't like using that name very much. No, I don't have anything against it. It's just not accurate. It's just not proper. At least from my reading of the Bible thus far, I may change my mind on that. What's proper is the term Messiah. Messiah. Use it. Get to know it. If you're having problems learning the proper name, Yeshua the Messiah then buy my Bible and read it. You will get it from that Bible. And if you're having problems with Yahweh's name in particular, by God, get that Bible and read it. I'm going to tell you where the screw-up occurred. The screw-up occurred is because we think that his name is God. God is a class of people, if you will. It's, a, it's, a, it's not a proper name. It is a classification it's an object series. It's not an individual. And we get that name from Gadriel, the fallen angel that seduced Eve, that banged Eve and fathered Cain. Giving us the bad guys. Giving us one of the two warring factions on the face of the earth. That's what you're living through. Those two factions are at war. The rest of the people... They really don't have that much to do with it except the evil guys. The bad guys are throwing them against the good guys right now. And they're doing it very successfully. By the way, that's what the Assyrians did, which resulted in Samaria. This, remember the story of the Good Samaritan? The mind-blowing part of the parable is the Samaritan was an outcast. He was considered lower than the Jews, lower than the Judeans, because they were of mixed seed. Mixed lines. You see, Yahweh makes it very clear, if you bother to read his Bible, that he loves his creation the way he made it, and it was all good. 
But you and I have to go around screwing it up, quite literally effing it up. And so we create these creatures that have got internal conflicts in themselves, and they suffer for it. Not only that, but the others out there reject them. That's the worst part of it, probably. No, I think the confusion of face, the confusion, the internal conflicts they feel is worse. From what we can tell, that's what goes on. The, the honest men that we talk to that have got these problems and share those with us give us the evidence so we understand this stuff. And we need to talk about it more. It helps give them relief. It helps give us relief, too. It helps us all to get better understanding and so we can get along. There's nothing wrong with a black family. They were better than we were at the turn of the century. And I'm not talking the last turn, the turn before. The black man had total control over his family until two things came along. Alexander, Alexandria from Russia, who toured the country and launched the movement, <clears throat> the Ephenist movement, she toured the country in 1911 from Russia, and she stirred up the pot. You ended up having the flappers and all this sort of stuff. The women thought that they were being independent, strong, brave, and independent, not realizing that they were undermining themselves, undermining their future families, undermining their nation. Because any time a nation becomes a matriarchy, it ceases to exist in short order. America today is a matriarchy. My uncle's made the mistake of fostering a matriarchy. He's going to be buried, but not on the family cemetery plot. He's going to be married on his first wife's family cemetery plot. Man, the Bible says clearly, when two get married, the woman shall leave her family and go to the man's family. Sorry, uncle, you blew it on that one and everything else. And you've abandoned our family. Yes, you have. I don't want you to see this. I don't want to put any stress on you. I have so much respect and love for you. It's not funny. But I can't let you go against the family. So I'm, I'm coming for you. In the name of all of the Kents. You're not going to. At least on my watch. Allow this family to die and to cease to exist from the face of the earth. Face of the earth. You've capitulated to two women in a row. They treated you horribly. The last one abused you up to yin yang and reduced you so she could d d dominate you and command you and take everything from our family to her family. And you're going along with it. <laughs> I'm sorry. It's not going to go well. By every strength and fiber in my being, it's not going to go well because I am going to fight and I'm not going to stop. <clears throat> I love you, Uncle Roy, but it's really simple. Either heed to my next letter and realize the wisdom contained therein and realize how important it is to do what's in the best interest of the Kent family. The Kents brought a state to the whole world. There were no states under the kings until the Kents established it. We established the concept of a state. The kings gave the Kents a loyal title. In no other county, only in the county of Kent, was a loyal title granted. All other counties, the titles were limited, and the king could take the land back at any time he wanted it back, but not in the county of Kent. We were so strong, we had fought so well for him and served the king so well that he recognized the valor and what we had done. Hell, we established that whole crown on England. And when we got to the new world over here, we had a loyal title, which evolved into patented land. The governors would patent the land. They would sign off on it and seal it. So nobody could attach your property. Nobody could tax your property. Nobody could take it from you. Just like in the days of ancient Israel from whence we came. 
I love the Bible, living by the terms of it, learning the wisdom. It's a never-ending thing. It's not boring at all. I mean, there are some pretty tedious passages. When you get to a tedious passage, you skip over it. It'll have more meaning later. It'll open up to you later on. Don't worry about it. There's plenty else to read. Just open up and read what you want to read. I used to start with the book of John all the time. They didn't call me John back then. And in my dream, people started calling me by my family name. Okay. I don't know. It's become a girl's name at this point, so I got mixed feelings on it. I tried to correct people about a decade ago, but they don't listen to me. Folks, the same wicked people are running the show in our nation that have run the earth during the, this entire earth age and I believe several previous earth ages. From my reading and my research and my antenna, my intuition, I would say they've been on the earth for a half a dozen earth ages. Maybe more, but probably five or six, right around there. And they dig in because they know what's coming. And then they come out on top. And they do their bullshit all over to it again. Where we have to reinvent the wheel. Literally. And we have to rediscover all this technology. And they're sitting back with a treasure trove of this stuff. Locked up, keeping it from the rest of us. The civilizations that existed during previous Earth Ages were better than we were. The last one in particular had superior laws. A lot better laws. That's what they were noted for. The ones before that had some incredible technologies. And then all of this stuff that we think we know in history is a bunch of lies and BS. They're, they've been busy during my entire life destroying history as fast as they could. And I don't remember a lot of the stuff I read when I was a little boy, but I remember Tartaria. It was on the maps. I remember these wicked creatures in the oceans in different parts of the sphere. I remember the earth being mapped out differently. And then I, I bet you don't know about the mud flood. Or should I say mud floods? You need to understand. There have been several mud floods, not just one. You want the evidence? You go to Easter Island. I think I got it right. Those big heads sticking out. That's just the head. The full body's down below. They're full statues. Massive. They've been covered up by each successive catastrophe of each Earth age. The Earth is growing. It's getting bigger, literally, physically. During this next time, the Earth's mass will increase by approximately one half of a percent. Do I have that right? I think I have it right. And that will throw off the whole planet. It'll have to rebalance itself. It'll have to be reborn. It'll have to go through purification. It will be made white as snow. Another ice age to purify the ugliness that we've done to it. And those modern nuclear weapons aren't so modern. They've been around for a long time and they've been used at different times. So I want to know where the dudes are that nuked the city in the Indus Valley 1500 years ago. Because Sodom and Gomorrah was a lot further back than that. But whoever it was that nuked in this valley is somewhere to be seen. Maybe off in the Netherlands, in a part of the world we don't know about. But those nuclear weapons were here 1,500 years ago, and you and I are walking around like, they just we just discovered the A-bomb. We discovered the atom. We just created and invented the nuclear bomb. And they got bombs bigger than that. They got bombs that are continent busters planet busters and you people want to go to war this one bomb i understand is so powerful if they were to blow it up in the middle east it would take most of europe with it it's a planet busting bomb and you want to let them take you to war are you going to let them take you to war i think not i pray and i hope not but if you do that path has already been laid out. We already know what the moves are going to be. 
You know, if we were smart, we'd go listen to the contemporary prophets, the prophets that are alive today and the ones that lived in the last century, especially the ones in the last century because their stuff is pretty profound and they all seem to agree. Russia will invade and go to the Rhine. America will step in and Poland's going to get hit when the Russians go through it and they're going to hit when the Americans go after the Russians that are occupying it. The Polish people are precious to me. They're near and dear to me. Yeah. Yeah. Novak. Yeah. My dad used to tease my sister saying that we shortened our name from, from Kent Kowski to Kent and we were Polish. He would tease her about it. She didn't like it much. What the heck? Her mother was Polish. <laughs> you know? Okay, a mix. Polish and French Canadian. We're all mixed, folks. We're all mixed up. We don't know what our DNA is from. There has been a lot of engineering in our DNA. And there have been a lot of species on the planet. And pieces for every one of those species probably have been used in getting us to where we are today. And creating what you look in the mirror and say, you say, I'm a man, I'm a woman. Right. And you think it's simple. It ain't simple. And you think, well, I just came from my parents. And from me, a lot of people will be born. The tree of life is just going to sprout out. No, it's the other way. You're right here at this focus point in time. One person right here. That's it. Just you. But you got two parents behind you. And there's four grandparents beyond them. And eight great grandparents beyond them. And then 16. And then 32. Then 64. Then 128. It gets bigger and bigger as you go in reverse. And you and I need to be grateful to the survivors that were able to reproduce. Because without that, you and I wouldn't be here. You have to be glad for the good times and the bad times. And whatever it was, they overcame and survived and were able to procreate. The gift of life. Yes, you've been given this life. Now, as far as the structure goes and whether or not the soul is immortal, that's another discussion. We've got good indicators of that with the out-of-body experiences, with the fact that we know that we are an electromagnetic field into this body. It's an electric universe. And as far as the second death goes, my best get is they take apart that electric magnetic being cast in the lake of fire saying ah time to recycle that one it didn't work out too good <clears throat> I think that stuff's all real folks unfortunately some of these ideas that others among us have we condemn we don't bother to listen to them and take the time to understand them if we did we could learn so much and we would be way ahead in our understanding you see, heaven is on the earth. It's been on the earth for a while. It was announced more than 2,000 years ago. Well, actually not quite more than 2,000 years ago. The year he would have been crucified, we all want to say 33 because he was 33 years of age, but I think that he was born 4 B.C., which would put it about 29. What else happened in... 1929. Well, here we are coming fast upon 2029. The millennial birthday of Yahweh in the flesh. I wonder what's in store for us then. Okay, folks. Do buy my Bibles. Give this one a thumbs up. Um, Subscribe only if you're getting something out of it. Do not share widely. Do not cast your pearls before swine. I don't want you giving this to somebody that's going to be offended and make reports about it. Because YouTube will take some, find something and they won't tell us. They're not a fair group. That's all there is to it. I want to turn you into a bunch of Bible readers. 
because then you will be infused with the Holy Spirit. It happens over time. And it's wonderful. To have this level of consciousness is very cozy. It's really nice. You understand things. You're going to be able to accept things better. We're all mortals. We all have to die. That's all there is to it. Now, the severe praetorist will tell you that's it. Nothing more. And that Yahshua, the Messiah, he has eternal life. And the fact is that we are his temples. So perhaps we are his eternal life. But one thing is for sure, those children that y'all have been having and not taken care of, that is your eternal life. We know they're carrying on. We also know we're facing another earth catastrophe and we're facing another man-made catastrophe. Which one's going to overtake us? Which one's going to kill more of us than the other? We also know the evil ones just destroyed a billion of us in the last three years. So I, I really would like to see the numbers. I don't have any good evidence of that. There was a report from a woman out of Canada that gave that a, a very brainy nurse. Beautiful woman, by the way. Happily married, well married. I mean, she was, she was really attractive. And uh, good heart. Must have an incredible husband behind her. I know that we used to say that he's got a great woman behind her, behind every great woman, great man is a great woman. But we have reversed things. We've gone from being a patriarchy to being a matriarchy, which means that we are going to disappear from the face of the earth. That is what has happened in every culture, and that's according to Unwin, published in 1934. The problem Unwin has is he was two years before a big thing occurred. And he had already written his masterpiece book, which you can get freely on the open internet. It's like 750 pages long. It's a big PDF, so don't ask me to send it to you because it's too big. 1932, he finished his research for sex and culture. And he wanted to wait two years to make sure he was absolutely correct before he published it because it was his life's work. It's probably one of the six greatest works in the history of mankind. And it basically said that when female sexuality became unbridled, two things occurred. Number one, you couldn't put it back in the bottle. That's his conclusion. It's not mine. Number two, he observed that in every culture in history that he had studied, once that had occurred, soon thereafter, the culture ceased to exist. It disappeared from the face of the earth. That civilization was doomed and destroyed. So that's what you're headed for in this nation right now. They've got us cut up, divided, man and woman, and a whole bunch of other genders too now. I love the creativity of it. I mean, you got to sit back and admire how hard they're trying. But you have to realize that this is a war in which they divide us and conquer us. And they're doing a real good job. And there are some young, smart women, and they're real beautiful, too. They're on the Internet these days. Most of them, I look at them and feel guilty because I find them attractive and they're so beautiful. But, you know, because I think they're children. I'm worried about that at my age. I don't want to be I don't want to be falsely accused. My sister accused me of that crap the whole time I was growing up. My parents let her do that. She was hell on wheels. Yeah, accused me of being child molester while I was growing up. What an ugly thing to be doing to your brother. What a horribly destructive, manipulative thing. And she always called me faggot. Yeah. She teased me incessantly. All right. You see these hands? They're very small. I should have been a surgeon, perhaps, because these are so small. I've seen some women with smaller hands than these. Small hands like these, you can do really delicate surgery, delicate moves. But I hate it when I have to shake hands with a man because his freaking hands are so big and mine's so small and his. It's like, might as well give up, man. You know, you know who's the greater man, who's got the bigger hand. And I have shaken hands with some incredible men that have done incredible things for this nation. I grew up with one who's seen more combat time than anybody else that I've ever met. You would never know 
that these men have done these things, that these men are so well-trained, so accomplished. You, you just don't realize it. And when you sit down and meet them and talk with them for the first time, they are so kind and so gentle, they couldn't hurt a fly. Yet they've served their countries and served them well. The problem is we've been misdirected and misguided from the very top. The, peoples, the people that benefit from the wars are the ones that manipulate us into war. They love it. They love it because it helps them in the worship of their gods, which love human sacrifice, blood sacrifice. And they love it because they get to bank both sides of the war and fill their coffers up. And they set this system up that we live in today with all kinds of things that are rigged so that you and I are predated upon daily. And we think we're in the land of the free and the home of the brave. We aren't. When we were founded, the King of England, in short order, complained to his bar association. He said, why haven't you done as I've said? Why haven't you taken them to court and beaten the snot out of them? And the bar association members responded, King, we do as you say, but they read the law books and they know the law so well that they go in by themselves and they defeat us. The colonies brought more law books than any other place on the planet, any other place on the face of the earth. We all knew the, the heritage that we had. We all knew the laws that had been developed and the big major changes and we understood things in legal terms and we would walk into court and defend ourselves. We weren't wards of the court, treated as a juvenile with some attorney holding our hands, setting us up, taking us to the damn slaughter. The 13th Amendment the original 13th Amendment became the law of the land for good reason. The attorneys got us into war, the War of 1812. That's why it was passed and ratified. It is the law of the land. You need to embrace it if you want our nation back. If you want to reestablish the republic, if you want it back, you have to go to the original 13th Amendment to get it. It strips any member of the Bar Association. I think it strips them of citizenship. It definitely bars them from holding any public office. Any public office. They can't even be on the, they can't even be judges. That's right. You would think, well, that doesn't make sense. It does when you realize that the letter B, well, it doesn't stand for bastard. My grandfather's favorite word. Yeah, I inherited that from my maternal grandfather. Bastards! <laughs> Who's his favorite word? Anyway, stands for British. Dare I say British bastards? Yeah, they're beholding to the British. They always have. They have sold us out the whole way. That's why you've been dominated by the crown. They own you. In, through a series of frauds and incorporations in giant shell games. They've been running the show. Your presidents know that. They won't be able to take office without paying homage to the king. And Barack Obama was not only that, he was a British subject from what I can see. He wasn't an American citizen. He was a British subject. And he didn't want people to know, so what did he do? He sent back the bust of Winston Churchill. It's okay by me. Winston Churchill was a bad dude. They used to give him a young boy every year. That's what the that's what the old wives' tales are. They they gave him a young boy he could bugger up and do what he wanted with every year. They bribed him to the highest degree. And by the way, he Winston Churchill was behind the sinking of the Lusitania. Yeah, he was the one that got us into World War I. He was the one calling the shots. 
and he guided. He knew where the U-boat was, and he guided the Lusitania directly in. And they also hobbled the Lusitania, having it run at a certain speed, so it would be easy mark, easy shot. And Lusitania was loaded with munitions. And after the war, the captain of the U-boat who took her down said he had his torpedo tubes loaded up to the max because he thought he was going to have to reload. He was going to have to put six torpedoes into that big ship to sink it. And he launched torpedo number one, and he was about to give the order to launch the second torpedo, and they were reloading the other torpedo tube. They had two of them. He was about to give the order to fire number two. And he saw in his periscope the ship blow up so magnificently, so much bigger than his little torpedo was capable of, that he realized he didn't have to fire again. The ship was sunk. Do you want to know why it was so easy? It wasn't just because it was carrying munitions on it. They had rigged the ship so it would blow up in advance. That was the false flag to get us into World War I. And the false flag get us in World War II? Jim Morrison of the Doors. His father, Admiral Morrison, he was ordered to set up the radio chatter to create the Gulf of Tonkin incident literally out of thin air. And sailors and pilots throughout the area were wondering, what the hell's going on? They're talking about this shit. We don't see it. I don't see it. Do you see it? No, nothing's happening here. What's going on in your place? Nothing's happening here. But we've got reports of attacks and bombs and all kinds of stuff going on with, with, with planes and with ships. Oh, my God. It's horrible. It's a war. That's how Lyndon Baines Johnson, LBJ, I remember that middle name, Baines. The Bane of Existence, LBJ also set up the USS Liberty so it would be sunk. They were going to get us into World War III back then. We know. The B-52 bombers were sitting at the ends of the runways that morning with the engines warming up. They had full loads of bombs. They all were carrying nuclear bombs. They were trying to get us into a nuclear war. And they were going to bomb Cairo. And then go after Russia. Look at all this bullshit, how manipulated we are. And the Twin Towers, when my mother complained that she couldn't get out of her mind. I said, Mom, Mom, stop watching it. That's trauma bonding, in case you're wondering. They traumatize you, traumatize you, traumatize you, re-traumatize you, and watch this shit again. To the point where you give in like when I yell like that and I calm down my skin relaxes everything gets prickly prickly a little bit I can become alive I can feel the electricity I can feel a little bit of adrenaline adrenaline is an extreme addicting drug folks you want to know why men fight together so well and why they're willing to go to war to combat in little units and do that shit they do there's nothing like the rush of adrenaline, of forward combat. Now, I've met men who said they would go across the country, drive all the way across the country to join their units again, to fight again. Old glory is not so glorious in some ways, pretty gory. Men can do amazing things on adrenaline, it's like my little girl, Lorraine, my little puppy dog. She doesn't look like she weighs 60 pounds. She looks like she might weigh 40, 45 pounds. She's solid muscle. She is so strong. I don't think, and she doesn't know how strong she is. Freaking chihuahuas chase her into the motorhome. It's embarrassing. I mean, all she's got to do is turn there and open her mouth and close it one time. That other dog will leave her alone, but she doesn't understand that. We're going to get you a big brother. We're going to get you a big, big brother. Big male Belgian Malinois. 80 pounds to protect you, sweetie. 
Yeah. She won't protect herself. Don't you dare go after me, though. Or if you go after her, yeah. She's fast. You can't see her. And she's so strong, I can't believe it. We're past our hour, boys and girls, ladies and gentlemen. I've had a good time. I hope you have, too. I hope you realize that when you listen to me that you're getting a lot of programming. There's a lot of things going between the lines. And i got a secret to share with you. I'm not aware of it. You see, I've been programmed up. I've been trained. I've been trained to the master's level of NLP a long, long time ago. I call bullshit on their stuff. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, what I want you to know is that I read the Bible. And I got a good heart. I got seven decades of proof on this heart. It has been refined in the fires. So when I tell you something, and when I'm talking to you, I know it's coming through. I know good stuff. I also know that people who are very advanced will listen to me and watch me and will be able to understand my weaknesses and what I'm saying and where my strengths are. I don't like that. But I have to be public in order to help you. And I kind of like to help myself. So buy my Bibles. Above all, get a case of them. Sell them. They're worth double the price. You might even get more than that out of one. I think the nearest competitor on a large print leather bound Bible is 150 bucks. Mine's way below 75. And I've got the cheapest price anywhere. So when you hit that link below, you'll find a pop-out menu that'll give you five different formats, different size prints, different colors, covers, and tabs or no tabs. Yahweh's blessed me. May he bless you. Amen.